Thank you, Mois. <laughs> Tim, it's great to uh, uh, see you. I um, uh, wish you could be on stage with us, uh, obviously. Um, it's a huge opportunity for me to be able to have that conversation with you. Um, and, you know, I, I would like to explore two things. Uh, maybe try to have in simple words your vision of what uh, technology is for the future and what's in for you, for us, and, you know, what type of positive force can we get out of technology. And the second thing is, uh, you know, when we announced yesterday um, on the, the Brute Network that we were going to have this conversation, uh, we had plenty of people asking very simple questions. And when you look at it, actually, it's, it's pretty much all the same question all the time. You know, everyday, everyday uh, people question is where I want to go. Um, of course, I want to start with COVID. Uh, COVID redefined what uh, connect being connected is. Um, how did you cope with the pandemic? And how did it change your vision of the role of Apple in the new world that's coming for us? You know, it's really been a tough and tragic period for so many people around the world, and so many countries are still going through it right now. And my, my heart goes out to everyone out there uh, who is struggling with COVID. Uh, I think it's incumbent on those of us who are coming out of the pandemic to help those that are still in the, in the midst of it. I couldn't be prouder of how Apple has responded and the, the team at Apple has responded in the pandemic. Early on, uh, right when the shutdown happened, we began to ask ourselves the question, how could we help? And the, the answers that we gave even surprised us. Uh, our supply chain team decided they could go out and source masks and donate masks. And we, we donated 30 million of them, including many to France. Our engineering team decided that they could design a face shield, and we designed it, uh, built it, and, and shipped tens of millions of those around the world as well. Uh, we kept on asking ourselves that question, and our software engineering team came up with that they could work on an exposure notification system with Google. And this has been at the heart of, of, of several countries' exposure notification. Uh, as the pandemic began to climb in other parts of the world, like India, we joined with Medtronic and a group of companies to donate ventilators to, to India. And uh, currently, we're working with Product Red to, uh, to donate vaccines to, to Africa, which is, is, is in, uh, you know, vast need for, for uh, vaccines. And so with every step of the way, we ask ourselves that simple question, how can we help? And I think in a large way, it wasn't just Apple asking this question, it was all of us. Um, I, I spoke to a developer from France last week, Guillaume Rosier, and I'm sure his name is very familiar to many of those in the audience. He developed the COVID tracker which was at the heart of the reference for so many people in France to see how the virus was, was moving. And, and uh, after that, built a, uh, a uh, app for vaccine appointments, uh, Vipa Dose. And, and so I, I just think it, the pandemic brought out the best in so many people and showed how resilient the human race is. Uh, and it showed how done right that the intersection of technology uh, with the humanities can produce some incredible things for the world that, that really improve it. So, so I, I'm, yeah, leaving sorry, the sorry for that. Um, I'm leaving the pandemic very optimistic about uh, what we can all do for society. Um, you were mentioning the intersection between uh, humanity and tech. At the intersection of humanity and tech, there's data. Uh, and there's privacy. And in, in order to build a better world, uh, of course, data is a key element. Um, can you explain to us, in a, I would say in a very uh, simple language, what privacy and, and, you know, means to you and to Apple? Yeah, we, we see it as a basic human right, a fundamental human right, and, uh, and one where We've been focused on privacy for, uh, for over a decade, for decades. So, you know, since the origin of our company 40 years ago, 
Um, Steve used to put it and say that uh, privacy was, was uh, stating in plain language uh, what people are signing up for and giving their permission and that that should, permission should be asked repeatedly. Uh, and so we've always tried to live up to that. Uh, you can think of a world where privacy is not important uh, and the, sort of the surveillance economy takes over and it becomes a world where everyone's worried that somebody else is watching them. And so they begin to do less, they begin to think less. And nobody wants to live in a world where that freedom of expression narrows. And, and so uh, privacy goes to the heart of uh, just one of the key values of, of Apple. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in Europe and across the world, uh, Apple is uh, a member of the GAFA club, okay? Um, do you think that means that uh, uh, you're all facing the same type of issues when it comes for, for, to privacy, for instance? No, that's, it's not an acronym that I like uh, because it, it tends to uh, paint the picture that all companies are monolithic in nature. And uh, all of these companies are very different. They have... Uh, uh, different business models, uh, different values. They, they are very different and deserve to be looked at, I think, individually. Uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's not an acronym I'm crazy about. If, if you look at Apple and, and look at what we do, we make things. We make hardware, software, and services, and we try to make sure that, that at that intersection that they all work beautifully together and seamlessly together. Uh, we focus on making the best, not the most. And so that rarely puts us in a position of, of top market share. I, I think in France, our market share for iPhone is about 23% as an example. And, and so these things are sort of fundamentally different across the board with the, the different companies. And at our bedrock values, our privacy, as you just said, and of course, we're putting a ton of energy in climate change because we, we believe that it's one of the most important issues of the century, as is privacy. I will get back to, uh, to climate change uh, uh, in, a, in a second. Um, of course, that leads us to um, uh, regulation. Uh, you know, uh, the French president was on stage uh, a minute ago, um, and there's a, a huge debate in, in Europe right now, uh, very pushy on regulation. How, how much do you think? Government should regulate your activities? I think that there is arguably has been very good regulation uh, coming out of Europe in places like the GDPR. Uh, the GDPR set not only a standard for, for customers in, in Europe, but, but really set the stage for the world to adopt GDPR. Uh, because most of the companies are multinational companies and they wound up implementing this around the world regardless of, of the regulations in those places. And so we were, we were big supporters of GDPR from the beginning. And, and we would support uh, going even further than GDPR in privacy because there's so much still left to do in the privacy world. Uh, we work with governments on environmental initiatives. And uh, many of these are a combination of public-private partnerships uh, that we've been able to do extraordinary things. And so the, the, as I look at the uh, tech regulation that's being discussed, I think there are good parts of it, and then I think there are parts of it that are not in the best interest of the user. And what, what we at, do at Apple, we always focus intently on the user and what is in their best interest. And so if, if you take an example of where I don't think uh, it's in the best interest, the, the current DMA language that is being discussed would force side loading on the iPhone. And so this would be an alternate way of getting apps onto the iPhone. As we look at that, that would destroy the security of the iPhone and a lot of the privacy initiatives that we built into the App Store where we have uh, privacy nutrition labels and app tracking transparency where it forces people to get uh, permission to track across apps. These things would, would not exist anymore 
uh, except in people that st stuck in our ecosystem. And, and so I, I worry deeply about privacy and security. Uh, and so what, what we're going to do is constructively take part in the debate and, and hope that we can find a, a, a way forward. As, as I said, there are good parts of, uh, of, the, of the regulation, like the parts of the DSA, I think, are, are right on. And so, so I, do, I do think it's just one of those areas where we, we have a responsibility to say when it's not in the best interest of the user that it's not. So would you say, like, if, if I try to sum up, would you say that uh, side loading, to your point, uh, side loading is uh, damaging the, the, the action you're taking to try to protect privacy? That's the way to put I it? I think it's, y yes, I, I would say that. I would say it would both damage privacy and security. I mean, you, you, th you look at malware as an example, and Android has 47 times more malware than iOS does. Why is that? Well, it's, it's because we've designed iOS in such a way that there's one app store and all of the apps are reviewed uh, prior to going on the store. And so that keeps a lot of this malware stuff uh, out of our ecosystem. And, and customers have told us uh, very continuously how much they value that. And so we're, we're going to be standing up for the user in, in the discussions, and we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, I think most people looking at security know that security is a major risk. And, and uh, I think a lot of people increasingly agree that privacy is one of the most important issues of the century. And so I'm, I'm optimistic about how it will go. So we've, we've talked about the impact of technology in our society. Um, uh, the U.S., France uh, went through very traumatizing event uh, recently. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen the spread of misinformation, uh, of conspiracy theory. Uh, of course, and we are in the temple of uh, tech for good and, and, and uh, tech as a positive force. Um, you know, how do you see the, the, the dark side of the technology? Well, I think... I think that we all need to understand that technology by itself doesn't want to be good. Uh, it doesn't want to be bad either. It's, it's neutral. And the, whether it's uh, great or not depends on the inventor and the creativity and empathy and passion of the inventor. And, and so I think that's, that's an important lens to, to have on technology. We do suffer today from uh, vast disinformation. It's affected the uh, vaccine rates and, and things like that. Uh, we've, we, we've been affected here in the United States by uh, sort of the stirring of the pot socially and uh, what disinformation has done. And, and so it's clear that there needs to be uh, something done here. This is not an acceptable state of, of the world. And uh, as I look at the DSA, there are some, uh, there are some parts of it that I think uh, will help this. But I, I'm not sure that anybody yet has a handle on how to fix it entirely. And I, I think it deserves more, more discussion and, and more debate. Um. I would, I would like to move on to a question I've picked up in a, a social feed and social thread since yesterday when we announced uh, the conversation between the, the, the two of us. Um, uh, and just before that, I'm, I want to go to the, uh, you know, to the environmental co uh, commitment from Apple. Um, you've set some very aggressive goals. Uh, by 2030, uh, you want to be carbon neutral. Um, you know, how can you reconcile, and it's a question I've seen often, how do you reconcile those very ambitious goals and you know, uh, shipping a, a new iPhone every year? It's a, it's a question in the, in the mind of, of the people. How do you do that? How can you reconcile uh, yeah. very aggressive um, uh, environmental goals and shipping new products line? It's a good question. If, if I back up for a moment, uh, we're carbon neutral as a company today. We achieved this a couple of years ago. Uh, what we've done now is expanded our view of what carbon neutral means and said, 
for our supply chain and for usage of our product with the customer. So this total uh, food chain, we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. And so it's a, it's a very, very bold objective, far uh, more aggressive than the, uh, than the 2050 type timelines that, that you'll hear. And so how do we do that? Well, we, we run Apple on 100% renewable energy. And so we do that today and we're using uh, our influence to get our suppliers to run their businesses on 100% renewable energy. And I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that we have over 100 suppliers that have already signed up to do that. And so we like to think of that we can be the ripple in the pond to create greater good. And the, the other thing that we're really focused on is we've set an objective not to, to have to remove anything from the earth to make new iPhones. Now we're not there yet, uh, but if you look at sort of our latest products, 40% uh, of the aluminum in the MAC area is recycled, and 98% of the rare earth uh, minerals are, are uh, recycled on the iPhone 12. And so we're making enormous progress. And, and of course, we uh, are using robotics to disassemble older iPhones to, to be the heart of newer iPhones. And, and so the, the trick is to have a closed loop between the selling of new product and the retirement and uh, secondhand markets. And I, I feel like we've done a great job of that. As it turns out, a great product for a user and a great product for the planet uh, can, be, can be one and the same. And that's the objective that we set for ourselves. And as, as you say, um, Apple is a, a huge uh, and very successful company. So you need to lead by example, and you can kickstart a lot of usage. It's what you were mentioning with your supply chain. Um, the, when I was reading uh, uh, messages on, on the, our social uh, um, pages, um, you know, a lot of people were saying you need to lead by example. It's true when it comes to... Uh, working condi condition across the globe. It's true when it comes for taxis. And when we take taxis, for example, uh, a lot of people are thinking that you're not uh, doing your fair share uh, in terms of, uh, of taxis. What's your view on that? Well, here, here are the facts on taxes. If you look at across the last decade, uh, the most recent decade, our effective rate of tax is 23% which is about the same as uh, OECD companies and uh, right in the ballpark of what companies pay in Europe. The, the thing that is different about us is most of our uh, R&D is in the United States. And so we pay relatively more to the US and that has been a, an area of contention uh, about how we split the pie of this, of this 23%. And uh, as it turns out, I think the OECD, which is headquartered there in Paris, uh, are working uh, vehemently on this. And I, I think they're going to do a, a get to a, to a conclusion that will be good for everybody. And so we've always supported, uh, you know, the OECD deciding on this. Uh, we, we, are, we believe that taxes are so essential to providing services for citizens around the world. And we do want to, to pay our fair share. And I, I think largely we're paying the total amount that people are talking about, uh, but the, where it's divided up is sort of the, the issue. And I hope the OECD uh, concludes and, and we can all move forward and feel good about it. <laughs> I hope so. Um, to, to, to move forward, um, in, in France, we used uh, an expression for the past year about, you know, teenagers, uh, young adults, which is uh, they are mm -hmm. lost generation because of COVID. Uh, as the CEO of Apple, uh, what, what could you say to uh, um, a young adult, someone who's maybe 18, 19 years old, uh, who's been through uh, so much this year, uh, who's uh, fa fascinated by tech? Um, you know, what kind of positive message can you bring to him or her? 
Well, I, I would start with, I do not see them personally as a lost generation. I, I reject the, the characterization. Uh, I think young people that I talk with are very values driven. And I, I see this in the love they have for the planet. I see this in the, the, uh, in the, the way they support human rights for all people. Uh, I see it in so many different areas. I, I see it in what they choose to work on. Uh, I was in a developer roundtable in France a couple of months ago on a virtual basis, and uh, there was a company called uh, Too Good to Go that focused on food waste. And so they had identified a uh, issue in society where the restaurants and so forth were throwing away all this food and at the same time, people were hungry. And so they were, they were attempting to sort of uh, to, to fix this. I, there, I've visited a, a company virtually called Classly, who was at the heart of providing virtual classrooms to, to uh, students and parents and, and teachers and so forth. And so what I see are people identifying problems with society and then putting all of themselves into creating a, a, a solution for the problem. And uh, I, think, I think these young people uh, are, uh, will be at the very root of many of the solutions to today's problems. I, I, I do think so too. Like we founded Brute on the idea that uh, young people were uh, massively engaged and uh, were really driving change. So yeah, I, I absolutely uh, um, agree. Um, you know, when you think about it, your products um, encapsulate a vision of society, a vision of the world. Uh, we're talking about new generation, about uh, uh, the future of technology. So right now it's the iPhone 12. Let's say uh, what's going to be the iPhone 30, uh, 20 years from now. Um, how is it going to impact our life? How is it going to change, I don't know, mankind? Uh, what's exciting for you as the CEO of Apple to, to develop? I know you, you're like big on the, all the health things. So it's many questions, but like, so let's, let's go for the iPhone 30. What will it be looking like? Well, it'll be uh, better than iPhone 12, and uh, you can count on that. Uh, and it will solve more p problems for people. At, at the root of it, what Apple is all about is about making the best products that really enrich people's lives. And we will not work on one that we don't feel like we can do it, do it to uh, meet that mission. And so we only do a few things, and the iPhone is one of those few things that we do. And so you can always count on it getting better and solving more problems for people. And, and so that, that's the spot. In terms of what I'm most excited about, I'm excited about so many things. Uh, I'm a, a great believer in the power of technology to help people. And uh, we, we approach the future with great humility uh, because we know we can't predict it. Uh, I'm not one of those people that is going to say, I can see 20 years out and 30 years out and tell you what, what is going to happen. I can't. I really don't believe anyone can. Uh, so we approach it with great humility. Uh, if, you, if you take some examples in Apple's past, uh, the, we didn't know when we were working on the chip for the iPhone that it would become the heart of the iPad. And we didn't know that it would eventually become the heart of the Mac, as it just did in uh, this, this past year. Uh, we didn't know that. But we kept discovering, and we kept pulling the string, and we kept our minds open about where that, would, where that journey would take us. And it, it's taken us somewhere that's incredible uh, and that, that, that has a great future ahead of it. I, I get excited about AR. I get excited about AR because I see it as a technology that can enhance life uh, in, in a broad way. And so we've been working on AR first with our phones 
and iPads, and later we'll, we'll see where that goes in terms of, of products. But, I, I, but the key thing is that it can enrich people's lives. Um, I get excited about uh, artificial intelligence and the, the ability to s sort of remove some of the things that, that keep people down and, uh, and do work and free up leisure time for, for people. Uh, I, and I am exceedingly uh, optimistic about the intersection of health and technology. You know, when we started, when we started shipping the watch, we did so with, with thinking about it from a wellness point of view. But we put a heart rate sensor on it and we quickly were, uh, I was getting tons of emails about people that found out they had heart problems that they didn't know about. And so we started adding more function to the watch, like we put an ECG in the watch. Uh, we put the ability to, to find out if you're in AFib. Uh, and I began to get even more notes from people that found out that uh, they had a problem because of this ability to continually monitor themselves. And, and so I, I think the idea of continually monitoring the body uh, much like happens in your car uh, with uh, warning lights and so forth. I, I think this is a big idea that has a long, uh, a long roadmap ahead of it. And so all of those things make me incredibly optimistic. So there's many ways you can explore. Um, do you allow yourself, and I, I said it because there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, or there's a lot of entrepreneurs watching us, or wannabe entrepreneurs, um, do you allow yourself to fail trying to develop uh, new products? I, I fail daily at something. Uh, <laughs> and yes, we do, we do allow ourselves to fail. We, we try to fail internally instead of externally because we don't want to involve customers in the failure. But, but we uh, develop things and, and subsequently decide not to ship. We, uh, we begin uh, going down a certain road and sometimes adjust significantly because of the discovery that we make in that process. And so absolutely, uh, failing is a part of life. And uh, it, it's a, a, a part of whether, whether you're a new company, a startup, or, or you're a, a company that's been around for a while and you're trying different things, if you're not failing, you're not trying enough different things. The, um, you know, the, the French uh, government just announced that uh, uh, curfew is going to be uh, over uh, soon in France, that uh, since June 9th, American citizens are allowed to uh, uh, travel to, the, to France uh, again. So when can we expect to see you in France? First question. And the second qu Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And second question I have for you. And I have to ask, it's like, where is the Apple car? You know, where, can we, where, can, where can we see it? Well, on the first question, uh, I'm looking forward to coming to France later in the, this year. And uh, I could not be happier to, to, to be doing that. I've, it's been a long time. It's been a long year and a half, and it'll, it'll be great to be back there. Uh, in terms of a car, you know, I've, I've got to keep some secrets. And uh, th there always has to be something up our sleeve. And so uh, the, the, I don't think I'll comment on the car rumor. Okay. Tim, thank you so much for uh, this uh, half hour of conversation. Um, it's uh, uh, super interesting, I think, for a broader audience to get your vision on the future. And, um, you know, to thank you for answering those uh, very simple questions. And I hope we have a chance to welcome you in our office uh, in Paris soon. Thank you. Well, thank you. I am a big fan of Brute. I love what you're doing. Uh, I think you're a great example of a tremendous entrepreneur and a great example of social done in such a way that is trusted and reliable and, and curated. And I, I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. I hope it's recorded for my mom uh, that we get that. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Oui, merci.
Merci Guillaume, c'est 